Okay, so uh, let's get ready for our final presenters. Uh, we have uh, Nancy Hoffman, who is the Vice President and Senior Advisor for Jobs for the Future. And then after Nancy, we will hear from uh, Bill Taylor, who is the Associate Vice President and um, Network Engagement and Growth from the National Academy Foundation. We are delighted to have both of these speakers with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Nancy. told you I was flying overnight. Uh, I actually feel quite coherent, partly because <laughs> I just came from California for a two-day meeting somewhat like this with uh, focused on career and technical education with uh, the 10 superintendents of the largest school districts. And California is such a disaster that there is such disinvestment in community colleges. There was never a really strong career and technical um, program set of courses within community colleges, the system's really broken and they have an enormously needy population. So to walk into a room where people are actually talking about strategies, pedagogy, workforce needs, and not simply saying we have no money and we turn away 200,000 students was enough to wake me up and make me feel cheerful. <laughs> Uh, I will tell you also, everything worked perfectly until I got off the plane and the taxi driver got lost getting here. He happened to be from Somalia, and we had a very interesting conversation because I read a lot of Somali novels. So, never mind. Um, so um, I actually going to do two things here. One is answer the second question that Tony and company posed uh, very quickly, which is the question about whether young people should have uh, should choose a career early. And my answer to that, and it will, you'll see why I say that, is that people, young people need work experience. And I bet if I asked you to raise your hands, how many of you have changed careers? <laughs> So they also need to know that what they choose first to find out what it's like in a workplace isn't necessarily what they're going to be doing the rest of their lives. So I'm going to leave that question there and move on. The second thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about a big issue in the US and then uh, talk a little bit about some international work that I've been lucky to do and uh, particularly about skills learned not, to, not in school but out of school uh, in the workplace. So this may not be such a surprise to you, but we have a serious, serious problem at this point in this, in this country with young people getting any work experience. About 26% of young people um, are employed, this is 16 to 19 year olds, the lowest number since the Second World War, and I think the CT person said 26% unemployment um, in, uh, North Carolina for, for young people, uh, which, is, which is relatively high. Um, low income youth are the least likely to get jobs. Many of you probably have helped your own children get summer jobs and internships. That doesn't happen for kids who are low income. Um, a startling statistic, only 8% of young people in our 20 biggest cities are actually getting any work experience. All those jobs that we had that were well, mowing the lawn, delivering the paper, uh, working in my uncle's store, which I did every Christmas, those are gone. And the other thing, of course, that we see is that young people, even from educated families, really don't know, their, their parents and they don't know what the jobs are. So we're in a serious, a serious situation here. Teams don't work, and they really don't know much about the job market. Um, this is just a, a, a way for you to take a look at uh, the international data on youth unemployment. This is from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, the OECD. If you know the organization, you probably know it, it provides lots of comparative economic data. And in the education realm, PISA, which is the test of 15-year-olds that always tells the US that we're we're stagnant and everyone else is getting better. 
Uh, the U.S. here is about halfway down in youth unemployment. And what you'll notice, and I'll come back to it, it sounds like a similar situation here in North Carolina. At the right-hand side, the, um, those countries that have very low youth employment, say below 5%, also, you'll see, are the countries that have very strong vocational uh, education and training systems. So, um, as I say here, you can only learn to work in a workplace. Um, and we really ha we have a problem with helping our teens learn to work. Um, we tend to have a system in which you go from all schooling to all work. And any of you who are employers, as I am at my own nonprofit, of even the most highly educated young people know that when they show up in the workplace, there's a lot that they haven't learned because they haven't been in the adult world. Some of this we can do in school with project-based learning, the kind of techniques that your, I, what's your, I lost Bob. It, what Bob was talking about, um, but nothing substitutes for real workplace experience. Um, teens are getting relatively little advice, although you may be doing better here in North Carolina. Um, and, and as I said, educated parents don't know a lot about the, work, the workforce. Um, so, I guess my message is, and this is the, these are the people in this room, there needs to be much more engagement from employers. And what's really striking, if I get to some of the European systems, is that um, employers um, are, feel as though they have a responsibility and that it's in their economic self-interest to really educate the next generation. Um, so employers here can provide some of the things that I heard already, job shadowing, internships, apprenticeships. But it needs to be done much more systematically and um, with a real attention to what happens to students when they're in the workplace. Um, a number of countries actually require that 16 to 19 year olds have workplace experience and that younger students all have some form, maybe two weeks in the workplace um, I was just in um, France, and um, the 13-year-old son of uh, a friend of mine was off trying to figure out what he was going to do for his two-week uh, internship. So, as I've said, the countries with low unemployment have um, very strong vocational systems. There's a social compact between the education system, the government, and employers that says that it's the obligation to support young people. And uh, these, the thing that I, in writing my, the book that I just finished called Schooling in the Workplace, I tried to anticipate a lot of US questions. And one of them is that in the European systems, people think that you're trapped into a plumbing trap and you're there the rest of your life. Now in the strong vocational systems, there are pathways that go from uh, 15 or 16 year olds through to a PhD, and those pathways are transparent, and many young people know that the best way to get a, a job, even if it's in, in technology or engineering, is through a workplace, in, uh, work, workplace experience. Um, this may surprise you. In the countries with strong vocational systems, this is not a track for low performing students. Between 40 and 75% of students um, are in a, such a system. Switzerland perhaps has the best system in the world, and that's the majority system. Also a very vibrant economy. Netherlands, the same. So I'm going to just spend my last couple of minutes here on the question of what kinds of skills need to be learned in the workplace, because just putting young people into a workplace is not necessarily what's going to teach them what they need to know. This is probably the greatest challenge once you have your, your, your work placements for students. So, um, and this, this probably will make it very, will, will be clear to all the employers in the room, but curriculum is, has to replicate what a real workplace is like. That is, things happen in real time that you don't expect. People get angry and you have to deal with customers. Um, Situations don't have neat solutions. Many things have to get integrated. 
And these are the kinds of problems that the curriculum needs to address. Switzerland, again, I'm using as an example. And by the way, Switzerland may surprise you. 25% of their young population are born outside of Switzerland, so it is not you know, all little white people in, in yodeling outfits. <laughs> um, it's a very diverse population, and they've taken their education system very seriously. So they, even though employers, about a quarter of whom take in apprentices who are three days in a company and two days in school, um, and they are not paid because the bottom, their bottom line, the company's bottom line increases from having these young people over a period of three years. What is hidden from, I think, most people looking at such a system is that there's an enormous infrastructure of support. So in Switzerland, this Federal Institute for Vocational Education spends enormous resources analyzing work situations and developing competency systems and producing with um, industry participation the curriculum and assessments that young people um, are learning. Um, and it might surprise you, um, if you read the book, you will find out that over a six-year period, the biggest sector in vocational education, which is called commercial training, um, invo they involved about 100,000 people in dealing with some complaints from employers, which were that students were not autonomous enough, they weren't making their own decisions, they weren't taking enough responsibility, and the curriculum today looks very, very different. I'm heading toward the finish here. Um, so, Another thing that might make you a bit envious of these other systems is that the qualifications for every job are nationally standardized and transferable. The question that came up about don't, don't, don't send my child into a narrow profession, the responsibility of the educators in the social compact is ensuring that the student has skills that they own, not that the employer owns, and that they are contextualized in such a way that there is, is uh, sufficient bread. Again, Switzerland and not a lot of other countries, you, you have to be credentialed as a trainer to supervise young people. And that means a, a, a rigorous training in an institution that is focused on uh, vocational education. Um, and then, to make it real, the exit assessments are usually given in combinations of uh, employers and educators. Probably some of this is going on in your workplaces. It may be going on in community colleges where students are getting certifications that have clinical um, requirements, but it's not widespread in this country. So um, I'm going to just give you a quick list here. Some of these things exist. I think we're going to hear from Career Academies next. The problem is we have lots of examples, but we really don't have a, a system. And so, in some ways, the young people who need the most structure in a transition from schooling to learning to work to work are getting the least because it's a kind of random uh, set of choices that are put in front of them, and it's not systemic. I think the final thing that, that I would say is that we have a long way to go uh, to deal with what is often stigmatized about career and technical education in this country. And I think this may simply seem like semantics, but in traveling around the country, one of the things that I am seeing is the focus on STEM, under which a lot of the same technical skills exist as in career and technical education, is really a way of helping parents, teachers, the community at large see that technical skills are not dead-end skills these days. Those are the sine qua non for almost everyone. So I will stop there, and I'd be more than happy uh, later on, if we have some time, to talk about um, some, some of these international examples. And these are just references, and I will leave you with those.